Let's give a big round of applause to the forward marching band. Let's hear it for them. My name is Oscar Morales, and I've been the director of Omega School almost 25 years. And for the past three years, I've been the Poet Laureate of Madison. So, uh, so we want to welcome you to the rededication of this historic building. And I'm glad all of you saw the importance of uh, what happens when the community comes together and reclaims some of our history. So I, uh, I was asked to commission a poem as Poet Laureate, and I have a short poem called Municipal. Reborn, reuse, rebuild. The first time I stepped into the municipal building was in 1994 in a meeting with Bruce Newton, who ran the Community Services Department. Thinking back 25 years ago, for a city official, he understood nonprofits. He helped create the joint proposal process where he wrote one grant for the city, county, and United Way. So you would have lots more time to focus on your work. He had an ingenious idea to create an advanced payment system so small nonprofits like Omega School with cash flow problems could start the year out right. Reuse, rebuild, reborn. The next time I was in this building, I was being interviewed on the city cable channel by Centro Hispano director Peter Munoz. Actually, he was right over there. For his program, Nuestro Comunidad. All I remember is that the makeshift studio had these large, fake ferns that actually looked really good on television. <laughs> Rebuild, reuse, reborn. The next time I was in the building, I was a member of the Community Development Agency and voted to give the Overture Center for the Arts a $100 million bond. And community activist Eugene Parks was there every meeting trying to hold us accountable for our actions. Reborn, reuse, rebuild. The last time I was here, I was here with my little brother Fabian and his brother uh, Jorge a couple years ago for the art exhibit titled Municipal. The buildings had paintings, sculptures, artisans, graffiti artists, the whole building was transformed into an art gallery. Reborn, reuse, rebuild. Which brings us to today. Most contractors would say, it's much better and easier to build new. And we can capture the essence and the history and the stature of this building. I am glad better minds prevailed, and we are standing in a space that connects the past with the future. Reborn, reuse, rebuild. I also want to, you can clap, it'll make me feel better. I also want to uh, have a young artist stand up Pranav Sood, you want to stand up? And behind me is his painting um, that's titled The Blessing. And it's, it's nice to see a young man honor not only the child, but what he calls his four mothers, his mother, his two aunts, and his grandmother. So I want to thank you for Really, I think what this building represents, connecting community, connecting family, and bringing us together. Thank you.
Finally, I want to introduce a good friend, a longtime supporter of Omega School. I think you were on the board at one time, Paul. And uh, he uh, was instrumental in saving this building at one point, I heard. And he's been involved in this building over 50 years, first as an alder and as our mayor for several terms. So I want you to give a big round of applause for our mayor, Paul Sogling. Thank, thank you, Oscar. I don't know, are there people in the hallway? Uh, anybody else want to step in? So. All right, so I, I do this uh, probably five, six, seven times a year when we do uh, groundbreakings and opening of buildings. And generally, uh, I want to rush through it. I want to uh, keep my remarks short and not torment people like yourselves uh, who are forced to sit there. Uh, endlessly it seems. So I want to let you know right now in advance, this is not going to be quick. Uh, get, get comfortable because this is, this is one dedication ceremony uh, which I really do want to devote some time and, and uh, share some thoughts with you. I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to put this in chronological order I think what I'd like to do is really for myself go all the way to the uh, beginning, at least in terms of my involvement with, with this building. Uh, first, uh, one specific introduction. Is Governor Doyle and Jessica still here? Uh, they were here a little while ago. So. This building was built and continued through uh, its opening in the latter part of the 1920s up through the 1950s, housing three principal functions. One was the United States Post Office downstairs. The second was the uh, federal judiciary. This was the courtroom. And the third was a number of related Justice Department activities, including the FBI, the U.S. Marshal, the Bankruptcy Court. And so for most Madisonians, uh, and, and I was one of them, the most frequent contact we had was the post office. Packages, and as a philatelist, the stamp collector, uh, coming in here to pick up new issues, commemoratives, plate blocks, things of that sort. But then in 1967, we had something referred to as the Dow demonstration, and we filed suit a young civil rights attorney here in Madison, Percy Julian, took the case, and there were about a, eight of us, maybe 10, who were plaintiffs we all had to raise about $25 each to pay various filing and court costs. We certainly weren't going to be paying for attorney's fees. And I was the first one to show up with any money, so Percy put my name first on the case. And it was known as Soglin v. Kaufman, and it was argued here in 1967 and later years in subsequent courts. And it's one of the most telling uh, cases in regards to free speech for students. Um, it is cited quite often around the country, uh, even uh, not just in terms of university students, but also college students. And it was in this, this courtroom that Judge Doyle made, made his decision regarding that case, which was sub subsequently upheld as, as the university mistakenly uh, took it on appeal. And Percy was joined by a couple of the most renowned civil rights attorneys of the era, uh, including uh, William Kunstler. Uh, 
I, as a side note, which has got nothing to do with this, um, I was very disappointed a couple of years ago when the U.S. Supreme Court upheld the discipline of a high school student in Washington who at a uh, event held up a banner uh, and was disciplined for it. Uh, it was seemed to be unbecoming and reflecting on school activities. The banner read, Bong Hits for Jesus. And I don't know what's so scary about that. Uh, poor kid got in trouble. If he'd been before Judge Doyle, I'm sure he would have uh, survived intact. In any case, uh, a lot of decisions were made in this, this courtroom. Um, it, one involved an assault on a uh, candidate for president. Scoop Jackson was in town for a fundraising event and a campaign stop, and uh, an anti-war protester spit on him. And Judge Doyle found uh, the assailant guilty of attacking a presidential candidate. And now came the question of sentencing, and the uh, the guilty party argued that since this was such a very serious crime, he wanted to be a martyr, and he was arguing for his own very lengthy sentence. Judge Doyle put out a one-page uh, commentary about the sentence and concluded by saying it was a very small act by a very small man and deserves a very small punishment. <laughs> and I think that really reflects uh, judges, the, the judge's wisdom and, and what he brought here, uh, what was recognized by President Kennedy when he first appointed Judge Doyle. So this building, this, this room in particular, has a great deal of important history. And then in 1972, in June of 72, our law school class was sworn in uh, right here in, in this room. The building continued under federal jurisdiction until we got into the late 1970s. And that's where we made a very critical decision. The federal government had decided to relocate all of the functions in this building. The first thing they were going to do was relocate the post office, which went out on Milwaukee Street near Stoughton Road across from uh, the Woodmans. And then the judicial functions, the Justice Department functions, were to move to what is the Kastenmeyer Building at the corner of West Mifflin and East, uh, excuse me, West Mifflin and Henry Street. The protocol for buildings like this is to pass them on to other units of government. And there's a food chain. That food chain is the state, the county, and then the city. In the 1970s, in the years prior to uh, the, the federal government leaving this building, the state had been on a very aggressive expansion plan constructing Jeff 1, 2, and 3, and they were still looking for additional space and additional property. I went to Senator Risser, who was the chair of the State Building Commission, and I said, can you please leave this building alone? We really need space for expansion. You guys have enough already. And uh, they did. Uh, the senator was very, very gracious about it, and so we'd cross one hurdle. Now we had to wait to see what the county would do. And the 30 days for the county to give consideration went by. They didn't do anything, and we swooped in. We had our resolutions and our budget amendments ready, and we spent a million dollars and acquired this building. We had several city agencies, such as uh, housing and what was then our city welfare department, 
housed in other facilities off-site like Doty School. The police department had already made one effort to leave the city county building and various city agencies were just overflowing in a period where there had been tremendous growth. City county building was finished in the mid 50s and now we are talking 20 years later, over 20 years later, and the city had grown significantly over that period of time. So my vision, which never came to fruition, was that we would take this entire block. Stage one would be to move the city offices into this building, uh, retain the post office, which we did, and that eventually, as both city and county government grew in size, the county would buy us out of the city county building and we would consolidate all city offices on this block. Maybe that'll happen in another Madison century, another hundred years. So I left office and left this all in, in Joel Skornica's hands and you know the rest of that story, the city uh, renovated. Uh, this room was turned into a meeting room for principally the Board of Estimates, other city committees. That end of it where most people are seated right now was used as the studios for award-winning city cable TV stations. These windows were all uh, darkened and, 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 and uh, dark paper put over them. And let me just say, about two years ago, when we were knew we were approaching, um, we knew we were approaching the renovation. I asked city staff to just take the paper off of some of the windows. And I just can't describe to you what the difference was between the paper being on the windows and opening up and letting in the light. And that was sort of symbolic to show what could be realized with this entire building if we made a commitment to not just fix, which is what was the impetus why we had to act, but to not just fix the mechanicals, the, the uh, heating, ventilation systems, the plumbing, all the things that were literally falling apart after 100 years, or close to 100 years, but to realize what the building was about when it was first designed. So uh, we spent all that kind of time that engineers and planners do in regards to figuring out who would be here, who would occupy what space, came down to the details with the architects, not just in terms of the renovation, but also in terms of the kinds of spaces we were going to have, what this room would look like, creating the much needed meeting space for public committees, for, um, uh, for staff teams, and how to make the building accessible. And here, I just want to make an observation about buildings and people. It's one thing to have a magnificent building and to be in awe of it. It's quite another thing to have a building which intersects with people's daily lives and for people to be in awe of how they can access and use and share that space. Right now, if there was just one of us in this room, the experience would not be what it is with 150 of us gathered to understand the nature of this building and appreciate it. That was the idea behind the original design of the building and that was certainly the idea in terms of preserving and restoring this building. It's not just about the architectural detail, it's about how we use and interact with the building and its elements. And for that, we are tremendously grateful for everybody who was 
involved in that process. So we went out to bid and the bids came in over. And now we had a problem. But the problem was realized and I don't know uh, if my phone call had anything to do with it. But let's start out, Mark Cullen. I called Mark and I said, we've got to bring this thing in under bid. Would you bid on the project? And I kind of, kind of played to his civic pride. This is a civic building. And so I want to start out by, by introducing Mark Cullen and just an enormous thank you for not just the quality of the work that was done here, but your recognition of the importance of civic life and government. So that's my introduction to J.P. Cullen as the general contractor. For those of you from the Cullen team, can you kind of raise your hands and show us who you are? And they worked with over 40 subcontractors on this project. And if you had the view I did across the street where you could look out the window and see what was going on on every level from the roof uh, through the building, you could get to see how, how complicated this was, especially with the restoration of the windows, which is a story in and of itself. So to do something like this, you have to have a design team. MSR Design Architectural Firm, please stand. Are you going to be in the room across the hall again with your presentation? 140. 140. I don't know if we can all fit in there, but uh, it, it, it's really a fascinating uh, experience learning how this was all done uh, in terms of design. Insight Preservation Architecture Firm worked with you, and who's there from, uh, from Insight? Do we have anybody here today from Insight? It would have been Steve Marshall, but I don't think he's Okay, so our thanks to Steve and his team. There were some city staff people, and here's where you get in trouble with names. Um, and I've got a short list of them. Uh, Mike Schuhart, construction manager, stand please. Um, where's Mike? No? Brian Cooper, I see, our project manager. I never can pronounce your name right because I always go back and forth. Uh, Janine Zwart, finishes and, and furniture. Amy Scanlon, our preservation manager. I saw Amy earlier, where is she? John Evans, the project engineer. <laughs> Karen Wolf, our arts manager and is responsible for a lot of today. <laughs> Lucas Wardell. Uh, Jeannie Hoffman, where are you? Where is, is, where is Jeannie? Is she really not in the room? All right, so she's around here somewhere. Uh, just doing a magnificent job. And she reports to Rob Phillips, who's here, our city engineer. Uh, and, and, a, and a hand to, to all the, the departments and staff uh, who, who were part of this. And I'll start, stop with the naming there. Let me give you some facts about this. 50,237 labor hours performed by, by J.P. Cullen. 
construction bid was, as we finally got it in, was significantly under our budget. And so we were able to do two and a half million dollars of additional restoration. And let me share with you what two and a half million dollars of additional restoration looks like. It's the kinds of things that you want to do in your home. $400,000 of additional uh, plaster restoration. 800,000 of exterior masonry restoration and cleaning. A half a million dollars in exterior historic window stripping and repainting. And part of that presentation will cover those windows and will also uh, get into the details of the color. Jeannie just walked in, say hello. The project started in July of 2017. We finished in August. Contractors worked 40 of 60 Saturdays, for those of you who enjoy overtime, uh, in order not to extend the move date, but absorbing the equivalent of 35 additional days of restoration. The masonry restoration lasted the entire duration of the project. It started on day one, and we were still uh, the team was still doing masonry uh, uh, restoration when we finished. The marble restoration took nine months, and the presentation in architecture will also cover some of the issues involved with marble. And let me mention uh, one of the things from the presentation. It's one thing to bring everything to the color it is today and to get it matched. But what we're looking for is the color the way it was 90 years ago. And that's a little more challenging. Plaster restoration took 10 months uh, with one of the most skillful plaster restorers around in the state. This courtroom restoration started as soon as the project commenced and was the last area that Cullen finished. All of the interior demolition uh, was performed by hand uh, using some electric tools, but there was fortunately no cranes in here with big heavy metal balls uh, smashing into things. Virtually the entire building's been retuck pointed. The exterior limestone was specifically selected by the Preservation Architect Insight and was sourced from a single Halquist stone quarry in Sussex, Wisconsin. So next time you go to Sussex, you can visit the quarry. The historic windows were coated with up to 10 layers of paint after having been stripped down to the raw steel. The green color you see today is a custom color to match the original color of 90 years ago. The courtroom woodwork consists of both wood installed 90 years ago and in 2018. Lumber was changed in 90 years and thus different stains were needed to get to the, the original color. And I just want to show you something here. Some of the decorative woodwork, there's these little sort of wooden beads that are part of the, uh, is that wing, wings coating, you'd call it? I don't know. But in any case, a lot of those were chipped and they, they've been restored. On the other hand, uh, if you notice in the plaques on the front, there's some cracks in the original wood, and that has been left. We didn't tamper with that. There's some parts that have aged, and just as we all get older, it's just fine to leave it age in place. <laughs> so uh, I'm sure I've, I've missed some people. Um, I just want to say that Doing this was obviously a real challenge, and it took a lot of folks in different private companies, as well as the city staff. But again, I want to go back. It's more than just a building. It's not a building that's designed to overwhelm us. It's not a building that's designed to take away our breath. It's a building that was designed and restored to engage us and bring us forth 
into the democratic process. And it's a building of the people and for the people. And for that, we're, we're very thankful for everyone who participated and is engaged. And we're thankful for so many people who came here today wanting to be a part of this, wanting to learn. And, and, and to learn more about their community, about their city, and, and what our future is. So, um, who and what's next? Because my script ends with my statement. What's, what's next? That's it, thank you all. And by, by the way, uh, I can't tell you the names of all the artists, but as you go around, Please come to appreciate that is all of the art local artists or most of it? Yes. it local artists. Um, and one of the pieces I'm most pleased with, I believe, is in Natalie Erdman's office. Right the it's off out of the office of the director of the plan department. The reason I'm so proud of it is the young woman artist was a classmate in high school of, of our daughters. And so that says a lot to me about the future of the building and future generations and their contribution to this endeavor. It's not just old people. Thank you.